and you, he's staring right at you as you eat. And he looks like he hates you, wants to poison you. There's no reason for you to be here. How dare you come in my restaurant? It is so, re I don't know whether it's racist or he's just an evil, mean guy. So the meal was terrible, too. For those of you in San Francisco who go in the area, I am not naming any restaurant by name, but it's, and I wouldn't name it at all, but, uh, you know, enough of that. So I want to shift, though, to something entirely different. The, one of the greatest unsung heroes in the history of medicine is Abe Hoffer. Do you, you know his story? Uh, let me tell it on the Savage Nation. He died at about 90. He was a Canadian doctor, a lifetime believer in the good of man. In the early 50s, he discovered that niacin lowered cholesterol, and he had a choice to make. He said to me once, he said, I could patent this and make a fortune. Instead, he gave it to the, to the world for free because he wanted the betterment of mankind instead. Would you believe this? A doctor did a thing like that in those days? Who would do that today? You'd call him a fool, wouldn't you? Well, if there's a heaven, Abe Hoffer is in it. You know, when, 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 remember that great scene in The Godfather? I'm going to go back to G1, GF1, where Don Corleone is in the garden. Beautiful, touching scene with Michael Corleone, played by uh, Al Pacino, in his last scene before he dies of a heart attack with the grandchild. It's actually a very touching scene. It was a very, I watched it the other day, and I realized why it touched me so deeply. My father had died uh, just before this movie. I remember when they were making it, and they sang it was coming out, and, I said, gee, my dad would love this movie. Then he died, and he couldn't see it because it was like from his ear, you know. So I watched the movie. It was very personal to me, that movie. But I remember the, the Godfather figure with Marlon Brando sitting in the garden talking to Michael. Well, no, you don't have to play it. And he says to him, he says, what's wrong, Michael? Michael says, well, what's wrong, Dad? And then Al, Al, uh, Marlon Brando says, with a, an incredible, what an actor this guy was. He says, I don't know, Michael. He says, I dreamed that one day you'd be Senator Corleone, you know, Congressman Corleone, Governor Corleone. We didn't have enough time, Michael. We didn't have enough time. And then Michael says, it's okay, Dad. We'll get there. You know, he said, okay, they're gangsters. But there was a human element in that interchange that's astounding. And I think about that with regard to the, petition, the situation we're living in today. I want to shift, though, to something entirely different. We lost the battle, not the war. Why people read the headlines and not the story. Michael Savage declares we've lost the battle. The emails came pouring in. Savage has given up. There's no hope. If we've lost Savage, we've lost it all. Well, there lies the problem. People only read the headlines. They don't read the story. The real story says, I haven't given up. I have great hope. We haven't lost it all. We can win this war. But you ask me, what war am I referring to? It's the war for the heart and soul of this nation and the rest of Western civilization, which is under assault by the government itself. I lay it all out in Government Zero. I want to tell you something. My book is not complaints, 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 complaints. It's solutions, 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 solutions. 41 action plans to save America. I'm not a defeatist, as my competitors may have you believe. Savage. So, we have gone from the Barber of Seville to the Barbarians on the Hill. This is the Savage Nation talking about all of those things. You know, you listen to Rossini's Barber of Seville. I heard it the other day in a car. I said, i got to play it for a minute, take a chance. Look how fast this man's mind could be. Listen how fast it was. Pre-drug mind. And you have musicians today, so-called musicians. They're basically barbarians, faking it as musicians. Everything is aerosats, the painting, the music, you name it. A collapsed, broken society with false uh, idols everywhere you turn, whether they're false preachers or false musicians, whatever, false scientists, whatever you want to do, wherever you turn. Aersatz, you know what I'm saying? Mayonnaise, not butter, whichever way you want to look at it. Uh, margarine, not butter, whichever way you want to look at it. Olive-like, not olive, uh, you know. And you ask yourself, how did this happen? How did the people become so denatured? And de it's, it's mystifying, actually, to think. It doesn't happen overnight. So if you think you're going to turn it around overnight, you're mistaken. When a thing like this happens to a society, it doesn't turn around overnight just because you know it, or because a million of us know it, or 10 million of us know it, or 30 million of us know it. You got to remember, it's a world of five billion people, most of whom live in the darkness of getting and spending. 
the darkness of getting and spending, the darkness of buying and selling, the darkness of entertaining themselves and shopping, the darkness of looking at sluts in Hollywood as the role models, not Martha Washington. The darkness of looking at fakers in Hollywood who are pretending to be heroes when the real heroes of the world are never seen nor heard, whether they be in Afghanistan or in Iraq or in a hospital room or, 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 or in a, a ward for crippled children. You never see these people. And so we live in the darkness. That In some ways, it's worse than the darkness in the Middle Ages. In some ways, although we are certainly better off physically than our ancestors were, although that's debatable unto itself. Would you say that we live in the light, living in a society that we live in today? You know, you look at men in the suburbs, the white suburbs. You say, oh, that's the lily white suburbs. It's all good there. And I see men with children and wives. They're probably decent people. They dress like boys. I just look and I don't understand it. How can a grown man walk around with shorts, I ask myself, and a hat on backwards pushing a stroller? Does he look at himself in the mirror? I mean, I'm not uh, the sartorial expert of the world, but something, there's something in that image that I feel as though I like from another planet sometimes. A grown man pushing a carriage wearing shorts and a hat on backwards trying to look like an 11-year-old boy. How does this happen? The, the father looks like Beavis and Butthead. Anyway... From the from the Barber of Seville to the Barbarians on the Hill was the little quip. Now we're going to play the Brandenburg Concerto by J Johann Sebastian Bach and think how we've fallen from the Brandenburg Concerto to crack music and whiny chick music in department stores in just so short a period of time. And you're telling me the dead white male has nothing to teach you? I would argue to the contrary. One of my listeners, who I don't know, Michael Sestak, heard my show of December 15th where I was talking about inspiration. He set some music to it. And the music comes from The Last Samurai, I am told, and it struck a, a chord. You're going to hear it right now on The Savage Nation. I intend to make this day forward the first day of the rest of my life. We can change our lives. You say, well, what's wrong with your life, Michael? Well, it's not that there's anything wrong with my life, but it's not what I want it to be. I don't feel that I'm inspiring people in the way I want to inspire them. You see, you can inspire through hate. You can inspire through love, hope, humor, the positives. I look at the history of the world, and I look at the world today, and I realize that if we don't inspire each other through positive attributes, love, hope, and humor, we're going to descend into the barbarism of the left and the barbarism of ISIS. You like me to be hard. You like me to be tough. You like me to give you the breaking news. You like me to be cynical. You like me to be analytical. You like me to give you stuff that you don't hear anyone else. I get that. But there's a limit to that. There's a lot of area beyond all of that. I think of Christmas. Christianity is the religion of peace. Christianity is the true religion of peace. Turn the other cheek. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. These are messages that come from Christianity. What can you do in an age of deceit and lies and terror? You can go to church again. However unneeding you think you really are, you know in your heart that there's something missing in you. You know that you crave something greater. Because the human being is not a dog. We are unique creatures. And we need something different than the bear, the dog, the snake, and the eagle. What is that thing that we need? It's the thing called God. The media has promulgated the idea and promoted the idea that we only need food and fornication. And so when people are empty, that's what they seek. And when they're really empty, what happens? They become drug addicts. They start with marijuana and they end up with heroin, crack, you name it. As God has been driven out of America, drugs have entered America. What does an empty soul look to do? An empty soul looks to fill itself, just as an empty vessel needs to be filled with a liquid to be complete. An empty human being needs to fill itself to be complete. And how does it fill itself? I know, again, many of you will laugh because you're cynical. Do you think a musician can play one day without inspiration from somewhere? The greatest artists in the history of the world were not drug addicts. They were usually God addicts. Look at the greatest art in history. You'll find most of them were super religious people who literally saw God in their living room and then took the power of God and that was transmitted through the paintbrush or through that piece of marble. How could a man like Rodin take a piece of inert stone? How? It's a different show than I've ever done in my 21 years because each day to me, I must tell you, I see as my last day and my last day on earth. 
Savage.